What's up, folks? Welcome to another week of the Black Wrestling Show. I'm Jay Hogan and got Mike Marlowe on the other side. What's going on, dude? I'm doing good, man. Just wanted to give some shout-outs to, to some people that have been helping us get the word out about Ty Ritter. We had Ty back on the show last week. Ty works with Project Child Save, and to be quick to the point, they're an organization that rescues kids from human trafficking, sex slavery. So they do this about as front lane as you can get. They actually go in the field and rescue these kids. So this is not an organization where you're donating money and then they try to work through the political system and raise awareness, you know, things like that. They're actually rescuing kids. So anyone who hasn't listened to that episode, go back right now, listen to that episode, share it with everyone you know, and then make a donation to Project Child Safe because right now Ty's trying to raise $20,000 in the next two weeks so that they can execute a mission successfully to rescue upwards of 200 kids. So every dollar counts, and it's you, you need to get on this right away. This is not something where you go, well, you know, I'll donate next year. No, once I get, or I'll do it. I'll do right it for now, Christmas. It's like, yeah. Well, you no, know, you should donate for Christmas. So that, that, that exactly. So these do. kids can be home so by Christmas. People, you know, a lot of people are think. A lot of people are thinking. Well, I'm blowing a lot of money buying gifts for people I don't like. <laughs> you know, for Christmas, once that's over, then I'll make a donation. It's like, here's this, donate. Or better yet. If you're going to buy stuff for people you don't like, donate in their name at least. At least you're doing some good for those people you don't or like exactly. and helping an or organization. Instead of, instead of getting presents for people who don't appreciate you, you know, go ahead and make this donation. Trust me, these kids will appreciate you a lot more than most of your relatives will. So just really think about that, man. So. Now, I spent a good time on Sunday raising awareness with people that are influential, and I, I actually had a little bit of success. I actually got Joe Rogan shared the episode on his Twitter feed. Adam Blake nice. of H2O nice. shared it. Roger Cross, actor in Dark Matter, he shared it. Matt Brown, not only did Matt Brown share it, he listened to the episode, which is probably one of the few people who actually did out of all the people who shared it. I appreciate that they shared it, right. but you have to wonder how many people listened to it. Matt, UFC right. fighter Matt Brown listened to it, and he went and donated. He was so moved by what Ty said, and it was always something that he was aware of, but the real gravity of the situation hit home when he listened to the episode. And then Freddie Christian of Mailball, he shared it, and he was very enthusiastic about getting the word out there. Jamie Josta of Hatebreed, also he has a great podcast, the Josta podcast, he shared it. John Joseph, and then arguably the number one strength coach in the business, Charles Poliquin, who's always supportive of these kind of causes, and us. He's always supportive of the show. I mean, his, his assistant got it on their Facebook page so fast it was within seconds of me emailing them. So he was very supportive as well. So those are just a few of the people that really went out of their way. A bunch of people tw tweeted both of us about making donations. Yeah. We appreciate that. Five dollars helps. I mean, we've had a, we've had a couple thousand people listen to that episode already. If if each of those people donated five dollars, we'd be well on our way to helping Ty achieve that goal. So don't feel overwhelmed that you can't donate a thousand dollars or you can't donate even a hundred dollars. If you can donate five dollars, which everyone who has an internet connection should be able to do, then do that, and it makes a difference. It adds up. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> so it's good to see that after this episode, it was just a little bit better uh, feedback than the last, than the very first time that we had Ty on. It was almost like right. crickets that first time around, man. So I think, I think, you know, each of these episodes were making people more and more aware. For some people, it's painfully aware, you know, but the thing is, we're not going to let up, man, because we can't. We can't let up on this. So it's right. just, that's all there is to Absolutely. it. So Yeah. So we're going to be... <laughs> We're going to be incorporating this into many intros and episodes to come, so get used to it. In but fact, now that we got that like, out of the way. Well, I was about to say, instead of other podcasts that are sponsored by the Panty of the Month Club or something like that, you know, our, our we're, I'm going to go ahead and just say it right now, make it official, that this podcast is sponsored by Ch Project Child Save. How about that? And when I say sponsored by that, it's just like, you know, their efforts is what's sponsoring this show. It's, it's what drives us. That's the energy that drives the show. It's not money that we're getting from them. We're trying to make it the other right. way around. So it's their energy. No, it's so money that we're giving. Price on that. Money that we're giving them. They're, they're certainly not paying for us to plug them, and they're certainly not paying to have Ty come on the show. That would be ridiculous. Exactly. He comes on the show, and anyone who listens to him is going to be moved to make a donation. So anyway, folks, go check out projectchildsafe.org. Go listen to that episode with Ty. Share it with everyone you know. And pick up Ty's book as well, My Body is My Own. You can get that on Amazon.com. Yep. 
All right, let's get to our guest. I've been I've been waiting all year to have this guy back. I know. <laughs> we have, we, we, we have only say that about, we can only say that about a few guests, man. Only a very few guests can say we've been waiting all year to speak to this person. <laughs> so well, the only reason I've been waiting all year is because I, I did pretty well with most of the goals that we all talked about at the beginning of the year. Didn't hit all of them, but I made progress towards each of them. So I'm glad to have Lee back on. Well, one thing you don't want to do is miss all of your goals, and then you're like, oh man, we got to talk about how I missed every single thing I put down <laughs> with Lee. So, I mean, uh, anyway, let's talk to Lee Boyce. Good to have you back, Lee. Hey, man. How's it going? Doing good. Good, man. Good to have you back on, brother. Yeah, it's, right been, now, uh, it's been the entire year. You've been you've been sitting you're sitting under a tree in an undisclosed location right now. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> He's doing surveillance on the car. <laughs> like, <laughs> That's it. Lee, no Lee one is knows so where Lee. I am, but I'm watching. Lee's career is blowing up so fast. He's got stalkers everywhere, mainly on Twitter. Exactly. <laughs> he's got to hide from everyone now. <laughs> so, man, how does how does your how did your training year go? How did you do with all the goals you set out at the beginning of the year? You know, it was pretty interesting. I, like, I can't I can't go and say that I blew everything out of the water, that I crushed everything and whatnot. Uh, getting busier as a professional as well, and doing a whole bunch of different things that definitely comes in to haunt real, true consistency that somebody can get in the gym, which it's not to say that I didn't have the ability to train on uh, a regular basis or regularly per week because I I was okay with that. But what it does uh, inhibit is the opportunity for you to really go after, especially when you're talking about strength goals and things that really require not only only consistency but adequate recovery. And that's one of the areas that – that that definitely needed uh, special attention. And towards the later half of the year, the later second half of the year, I definitely put that uh, into a little bit more perspective and tried to take my rest and recovery a little bit more seriously and saw quite a few uh, improvements in that department because of it. Um, but as far as the particular goals that I was that, that I had said at the beginning of the year, it's interesting. And I was waiting to do this this podcast and this show for um, at least seven months since we since we uh, linked up the first time <laughs> for the reason yeah. that for the reason that a lot of perspectives kind of changed and it doesn't mean right. that I'm turning into somebody completely different here but what it does mean is that you know you start wondering I asked the question why a little bit more than I used to and when it came to because I remember one of my particular goals was to deadlift 600. You know, and yeah. uh, I I yeah. PR'd in the deadlift since we spoke. I hit around, uh, I hit a 550 deadlift, and uh, I think I was, was at great. 540 pounds before that. So I did PR on the deadlift, yeah. but after a certain point and a couple of back tweaks and so on, I was sort of just <laughs> like, uh, you know, what's the cost benefit of this? And what added gain do I get from being able to pull 600 for one rep versus, let's say, 405 for 10 reps versus you know, 550 for a single or whatever the other numbers are, how much right. actual, how much actual transferability is there to, uh, you know, just like general life and strength and lo- longevity of my lifting career or whatever you want to call it, you know, and um, it put things into a greater perspective for me. So um, it, it changed the way that I train a bit. It changed my mentality towards it and opened my eyes to a lot of stuff that I see out there in the industry in and out of the industry by people who are influenced by these sort of things. So yeah, yeah, it's kind of it's kind of a, a gray kind of a response that I give you. So I'm sorry that I didn't have uh, some crazy numbers to, to no, but uh, just to give you some just to give you some food for yeah. thought with everything you said. I think I don't think a one rep max has to be as much wear and tear if it, as people like to think it is if you approach it in a certain way. So what I mean by that is like you said, recovery has to be paramount. So one thing I always do the day after a really heavy deadlift workout is. I actually get a sports massage, and I do that once a week. You know, and I'm in my 40s and, and have been working out hard since I was 18. So it's not really my age, but it's more just the accumulation of many years of working out hard that puts the yeah. mileage on. And I'm finding that those weekly sports massages make a huge difference. And I've been doing this for over probably coming on two years now, and I've been very consistent about it. I, tr- I treat it just as importantly as getting in my workouts each week. It's just as important as each workout I do for furthering gains. And that makes a huge difference. Also, I find that here's the mistake a lot of people make when they try to do a one rep max. They spend a lot of workouts doing sets of three, sets of five, sets of 10. And then they go, okay, let me see what my one rep max is. And one rep max is a very specific, takes a very specific skill set. 
So if you're really good at pulling something five, that's a different skill set than the ability to pull something one. The ability to pull something ten, much different skill set than one. So what I like, what I've been doing this, and what I'm doing right now as I approach hitting a PR for the year, is I just finished up a program, and instead of just going for an all-out effort on a max, I did something maybe 20, 30 pounds below that. So my goal right now is to pull 565. So again, let me pull 545 first and see how that feels. And I did three sets of one with that. Each rep felt great. It wasn't easy where it just ripped off the ground, but it was smooth repetitions. My body wasn't beat up. My back wasn't stiff. You know, these are all signs of success because the last time I pulled that much weight, I was pretty stiff afterwards. This time I felt great. So that's that's a big progression forward. So then I'm taking two weeks off in between each session, which is something I picked up from Mike Menser's heavy duty training system. And we talked about that on the premium episode last week, where this is a program I came across when I was much younger and I tried and it didn't work well for me at all. Just having that much time in between workouts, in particular upper body pressing, I felt like I got weaker each time. But I'm finding with something like the deadlift, which is so neurologically taxing as well as physically taxing, and as you get close to your one rep max or especially if you're doing a one rep max, you need that additional recovery time. At least I do. So I did 545 for three sets of one last week. This week I'm taking off. Next week, three sets of one with 555 will be the goal. And 555 for once is the most I've ever done. And then three sets of one with that, that's going to give me a lot of confidence going into a, a new PR for this year. So I'll take another week off. So basically every two weeks doing a deadlift and then go 565 before the end of the year. And my goal, like you, was six plates, which is 585, but close enough to 600 pounds. That one yeah. is going to be elusive this year, but I'm making progress towards it, and I'm doing it in a systematic and smart manner where I don't fear injury. I think a lot of times also people worry about getting injured. So when they try to do a one rep max, they may rip it off the ground, and then they hit that sticking point, and then they're thinking in their mind, like, oh, man, my back, I'm, I'm going to fuck up my back if I keep going yeah. here. So they just park immediately. So I think that if you take the time to work into doing that one rep max by working on singles, whether it's a rest-pause program or just doing singles with longer breaks, you're mm -hmm. training your central nervous system to do a skill set which you haven't been working on previously if you're doing multiple reps. Yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. But like you said, you may also realize, but just like you, sometimes you realize some of these goals, who cares about them? Like my, one of my goals was to sprint, do 20 all-out sprints, you know, 50 yards. I worked up to 15. <laughs> I was like, what, do I really need to do more than this? You know, <laughs> because 10, 10, 10, is, 10 is plenty for a workout. 10 all-out sprints, it's a good workout. 15, for sure. the reps. The speed is going down with each. <laughs> right. Beyond. But by the time you get to 20, you may be able to actually do 20, but those last five runs are not going to look like the first 10. Right. You right. Know? So that's right. like pretty much scrapped. Yeah, that's a, that's a really, really challenging uh, protocol right there. Like trying to do that many sprints, especially like you know, coming from somebody uh, with, with a background in, in track and field as well. I remember what my practices were like and, I remember yeah. the hard practices, for example, right. were something like maybe a six by 150 meters uh, with, you know, ample rest in between, but you're focusing on your form, you're going at 95% of your max speed and so on. So it's almost a race yeah. pace, but you only do six of them. And literally by like round four, you're lying on your back and like exactly. dreading the time that the time's up. <clears throat> and uh, yeah. puking usually happened early on in the season. Yeah, I was about to that. say, that's when the puking <laughs> starts right. happening, man. I, I remember that and just kind of falling out on the, you know, on the grass and just, you're thinking to yourself like, oh, I probably shouldn't lie down right now because there's nothing worse yeah. than throwing up while you're lying on your back. <laughs> so you just, and you just kind of just roll over on your side and hope for the best, man. That was like some of yeah. the worst. So, <laughs> you know, I, well, I remember when other, Mike brought that up. Problem. I was like, oh, God. When Mike said it, like, yeah, I'm going to work my way up to 15, I was like, shit. The problem is you're not – now, the problem is you're not actually doing 100% effort for that – because you can't for that many repeat efforts. So what happens right. is even on the first five, you're going – even if you – even in your mind you think you're doing 100%, you're actually doing 90% at best because in your mind you're thinking, I have to do this 15 more times. I have to True. do this exactly. 10 more times. That's and, also and the when problem. You get to round nine, when you get to nine, that's when your mind starts to tell you, like, man – 
you know, we haven't even passed 10 yet. And you still talk, you, you want to do that extra five after 10. So you, you start talking to yourself. See, it, it helped to be in track and field because you had a coach that was sitting on your ass. And then you always yeah. have the threats of things like horses and suicides and running with the cross country team if you don't, you know, get it together with your sprint. Stuff like that motivated you. But now when you're, you know, a grown ass man by yourself, it's just kind of like, you know what, dude? You know what? Seven is enough. Somebody, that's more than most people do. So, you know, who, who needs 15 when you can do seven? Because most people can't even do two. So you start negotiating with yourself. So, and say well, something. The tomorrow, thing is, man. though, you're developing, you're developing mental toughness training, though, which is the real benefit yeah. here. Because if you can do 15, 20, your mental toughness is through the roof. And that's not something people should minimize. So it just becomes a different goal. Like you said, I mean, and you never want to compare yourself to what the average person can do because the average person can't right. touch their fucking toes or do a pull-up to save their life or do 10 push-ups. So I, I never think, well, you know, the average person couldn't do this, so I should feel good about myself. You know, I never compare myself to the average person because that's setting the bar way too low. I mean, we were at a concert over the weekend and fucking – all, all the average person did in front of us was fart the whole time. So while we're trying to watch this concert, because there are a hundred fat motherfuckers, a hundred pounds overweight in front of us, and all he did, well, all I, all, the only thing he got out of the concert is letting out gas publicly for two hours. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! Yeah, <laughs> but man. It's just, it's just, uh, you also have to be careful that when you when you have old, when you have a variety of goals, you have you have to make sure one is not cannibalizing the other, and that's the other thing you realize is like okay, I want to I want to squat four fifty five, I want to deadlift six hundred, I want to pre- double kettlebell press eighty eight fifteen times, and then I want to do the sprinting twenty times. Something is going to have to give among those. So you start prioritizing yeah. which is the most important out of all of these, and for me it was the squat, and. No surprise, that's where I made the most progress. The goal was 455. I did 435 for three sets of one last week, which is more than I've ever done before. So that's already a success. And each rep, the, spe- the rep speed in each one was good. So I know I'm good for 445 at least, which is what I'll go for this week. If I do three sets of one there, then I know 455 is imminent and I'll hit that. So that, that one I feel the best about because that's the one that needed the most work. Deadlift is more of a natural fit for me. Squat is a more challenging lift. So to make that progress, I'm really happy about that. What, what about your other lifts, Lee? How did everything else go? Every, everything else went pretty well. Um, I was making, a, towards the end of the year as well, like uh, more in the summertime, I was making a focus on uh, just doing a little bit of improvement to general mobility especially and just uh, using lifts that were – uh, that would exploit that to the most that I could anyway. So instead of doing like a, a front squat, for example, or instead of doing a back squat, maybe I'd choose a front squat or even an overhead squat, you know. And uh, so numbers in those kinds of lifts, uh, the, the the strength went up for like my overhead squat. I was doing triples with uh, 185 to full depth in this uh, this year, which is pretty good for me. Um, I haven't really done uh, repetitions with that kind of weight before. So that was a yeah, you're, you're good break. You're six. You're six four. four, so I just want to emphasize. The, yeah, six four. I want to emphasize that to the listeners because someone may be listening, going, someone who's five two is probably going, oh, I can do two twenty five for sets. Right. So yeah, well, you're <laughs> every time you sit, every you're time two, you sit two feet from the ground, from buddy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, no, that was uh, that was definitely a nice little breakthrough, and um, you know, I just I did a little bit of overhaul to my training methods. Um, I also decided to get a little bit more of an affinity for the trap bar, which I, I like doing. Uh, this was. Yeah. Really, the first year that I started using the trap bar for my deadlifts, um, at least uh, repeatedly. I only dabbled with it before that, and I didn't have much that I could say based on experience about using it. So uh, now that I've got some good experience using it, I could uh, genuinely understand and realize how a lot of people try to force feed the deadlift often, and um, they're not necessarily skeletally built to to truly get the most out of that lift without compromising their form or their technique and whatnot without having to do something like maybe mount the bar on something higher to get that flat back position or use a medium sumo stance to get that flat back position or whatever it is, you know? So um, I definitely like using the trap bar for deads. I've got really long legs and a short torso as well. So it's probably one that I should be using more than I do. Because uh, I've, I've been I've been somebody who's a little bit of a prisoner to the to the straight conventional deadlift when maybe I shouldn't really be. So that that was pretty good that I made that discovery yeah. too. Um, strict press, the overhead press. I've had some good consistent numbers there. I hit about uh, two fifteen this year for triples, so that right. was pretty good. And um, yeah, I've been I haven't been benching too much, but uh, I've been staying around the same in terms of that. And yeah, that's basically it. 
just a lot of little discoveries about myself and about how training should sort of change and whatnot and uh, what's been working and what what can go away for the, for the time being. And uh, that's, that's sort of what this year has been about. It's about a few discoveries. Yeah. Yeah. And that's training is always a discovery progress. So that's, that's actually exactly. old. That's actually, that's all that, that's actually progress in and of itself. If they want to approach yeah. it in the right manner, you know, when you come at it from that, you know, aspect, when you, you, when you're not in a hurry to get to a certain goal or a certain expectation, then, you know, that's when, you know, training becomes really fun and becomes that self discovery. But I think a lot of times too many people want to get from point A right to point B and not enjoying everything in between that. It's that great matter in between those two points that truly, that, that really matter, you know? Yeah. And then what I was going to say as well is that uh, with regards to what you were saying, Mike, about uh, just uh, the, the compromise or being able to realize that one thing, one goal that you set can be, can happen, but it's usually to happen at the expense of something else that you go for. Um, that's yeah. very true too, because I remember the beginning of the year when we had our first talk, we were talking about our goals, and I was saying that I wanted to simultaneously deadlift 600, but as well, I believe that I wanted to drop my body fat percentage, yeah. get leaner, Remember. lose body weight especially, right? Mm-hmm. So, right, I right. mean, it's not like it can't be done simultaneously, but like the road to doing so compared to even just maintaining the same body mass – and doing uh, and doing that 600 pound pull, it would be uh, it would be a lot simpler if I was to do the latter rather than try to get leaner and drop down and try and then do uh, both of those at the same time. So it's a little yeah. bit more of a injury waiting to happen or or something <laughs> close, you know. Right. right. One point you made yeah, about the a- round back is a good one because. You're not if if you're doing a true one rep max, it's not going to be with a flat back unless you're a very precise body type, right? So people like our height, for example, I'm six feet, you're several inches taller than me. But if we're doing a true one rep max, it's not going to be a flat back. It's just not going to happen. Right. And that's 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 one reason why if you're working with a lot of clients, <clears throat> it would be to your benefit and their benefit too that you avoid one rep max because they don't have good technique as it is. It takes years to develop great technique on a deadlift. And if you have them doing one rep maxes, it's just going to compromise their mediocre technique even further. And there's real, yeah. whenever I see someone at the gym who's like some kid who puts a triple decker belt on and he goes to deadlift <laughs> 315 and, he, and his back is so rounded, it's, I mean, he, he, I, don't even, I don't even know what analogy to use. It looks like it looks like Ninja shoulder turtles. blades are about Ninja to pop turtles. out. Yeah, they're about they're about to pop <laughs> out of his head like a camel. Yeah, it's a Donatello. It's, it's, like, it's like why bother? It's, it's not it's not an impressive lift. It's even if you do pull it, so what? It's three fifteen. You know, you want to have at least five plates in the bar when you're trying to show off to whoever's around. You know, so, you know, wait until you're stronger before you do something stupid. I guess is where I'm going. It's like you're not strong enough to be dumb yet. You you should be wait until you get a little bit stronger. Then you can do some stupid shit. Right. Yeah. And I'm just on the flip side of both you guys because I'm nowhere near six feet. And so I can tend to really focus on having a straight back and also having long arms really helps me with that. And that's one of the things that kind of helped me kind of change direction with the way I did lift this year, especially just talking to Mike on the show, just different things like, you know, adding that, that dip and drive. And, and I've come to realize that, you know what, I could do a lot better, you know, with that technique than what I've done. Because, yeah, I'm one of those folks that – has like pretty much a bionic back and Mike's seen it before and he's kind of like, yeah, you using a lot of your back and I've gotten away with it for years, you know, and from, I don't know if it just came from just, you know, kettlebell sport and also just the way my torso is designed or whatever. But I also know that can't get away with that type of murder for the rest of my life. Eventually it will come back and bite me in the ass. So I, I so I made like a, I guess you can say, use one of Mike's famous phrases, a mid course correction, you know, about, you know, right around the summertime. We started talking about the dip and drive, and I really started, you know, asking Mike more and more about it, and he really started describing it. So I started playing around with it, and then a lot of things, the the light kept going off. A lot of things started making more sense, you know, and I really got to the point where, yeah, of course, when you're you're changing up technique like that, you're not going to start that technique with the numbers that you left off with the other technique that you had. Right. You know, that's a that's a that's a recipe for disaster right there. So you know, you know. Ego aside, I was like, okay, let's just take this down a little bit and let's really work on this and, you know, and just go from there. So basically, yeah, my number, I didn't hit anywhere near the number that I wanted to, but at the same time, I got through a whole year of doing deadlifts without any kind of back 
just tightness or anything like that. I never get to the point where I'm going to throw my back out or whatever. But there's been those times, like what Mike was saying, where you're kind of lifting and you're like, oh, shit, I think I'm about to hurt my back. I need to put this down. You know, and this is since the summer, I haven't had any of those moments. In fact, in the last five months or so, after every deadlift session, I'm, I started feeling it where I should have been feeling it, which is in my hamstrings and my glutes and definitely in my in my abs, you know, in my core. You know, and that's the way it right. should be. And then that right there made me happy as hell. I was like, finally, you know, that's the way it should feel. So I knew I was on to something with that. So pretty much I, prior to that, up until I started working on that technique, I think I got up like five, I, I got to 515 once, you know, and then I was just like, you know what, that's, that's cool now. Let's just take it down a little bit. So I've been really working right around like four, like 455 at the most now with this new technique. But the thing is, I know that when I pull it, I can do it for more than one rep, two reps with this new technique. But I'm still working on that technique. So, you know, kind of taking Mike's advice with the whole just, you know, going in and let's just start each warm up. Let's just say you start 315, 385, blah, blah, blah. Do it all one rep and just work your way up. And then when you get to like 405, 415, you know, right around there for me right now, just, you know, do three sets of one. And I'm finding life is a lot better that way because, again, just like Lisa, I, you know, I kind of asked myself, like, what is the whole point of trying to hit these big ass numbers? I look at the numbers. Some of those goals I threw out there for myself, you know, a year ago, I was like, well, what was the point of that? You know, I was like, where were you trying to go with that? You know, hitting 585 for five, why? You know, why, little dude? You know, what's the point? I'm like, yeah. you know, so. That, that means, you know, that that's, that's a, that's a, that's a 700 pound deadlift for once, you know, putting it yeah, in the context. Exactly. That was, <laughs> you have, no, no, what that was is ridiculous is what that was. <laughs> so, you know, at that point in my life, that was kind of ridiculous. But, you know, it was very, here's the thing about, you know, lofty goals. You know, for certain exercises, that's great. Deadlift is not one of those exercises for a lofty goal. It's kind of like, no, man, let's just, let's be real. And it's okay to be yeah. real with that because it's the deadlift and the deadlift is the one out of all the lifts to me, it's the one that will make you honest. You can't lie to yourself with the deadlift. You can pretty much lie with everything except that. And yeah. so that, that's, that's what ended up happening with me with that. And, and I'm a person that came, you know, I know Lee was saying that, you know, he kind of, you know, found his new relationship with the trap bar deadlift. And I had a great one with the trap bar deadlift, you know, but one thing that I learned with it was it was the perfect assistance exercise at the transition, I, it was kind of purgatory for me between deadlift and squat because there were so many things that I learned with that lift that benefited me in terms of squats and deadlift. You know, one thing about it was definitely keep really enforcing me keeping a straight, you know, keeping a flat back when it came to doing a barbell deadlift. You know, a lot of that technique I got from doing so many trap bar deadlifts because being a coach and watching clients sit there and do the Ninja Turtle syndrome, you know, when they pull that trap bar up and all of a sudden the, it's just like, they're like a cat that's being, you know, pissed off. You know, they're, it's like they have hair rising up on their back. So their back rises up, but their head, their head starts heading down toward the floor. So it just looks really weird. And you sit there and look like they're transforming into some type of bee creature or something like that. you like, and when you stand on the outside looking in at that technique, you're like, God, I want to make sure I never, look like that when I do it. So I always made a point to always film myself. A lot of times, most of the videos I posted last year were from me doing my trap bar deadlifts. And one thing about not only videoing yourself so you can get an assessment of what you're doing, but put it out there on the internet, you want to make sure like, yeah, you don't want to look like, you don't want to look like a Ninja Turtle and then post that. Yeah. So you, you definitely, you're very mindful of that technique about, you know, being vulnerable like that in front of everyone. So like I said, it really helped me, but it really helped me going towards squats. And which was something I had let go of for probably well over a decade. And I'm pretty happy with the squats. And, you know, my numbers, and I know my goal was to get like 405 or 5, <clears throat> which doing the low bar technique, really getting up to that was not a problem. You know, and that's the beauty of the low bar. You get to lift, a, you know, lift heavier weight. But at the same time, there's always this thing going on in my mind by doing that low bar technique, like, damn, man, I feel like I'm going to end up falling forward. And, you know, so yeah. you're constantly just thinking about, damn, I don't want to fall. I don't want to go forward. I don't want to go forward. And, and so I want to get to a point where I don't want to think about that. I just want to focus on push your hips back, tear the floor apart, you know, and, and, and really explode back up. And so I really, so I found it a little, like I was telling Mike on the premium episode, I found that going between mid bar and low bar, so in between there, really worked out for me in my torso because, again, Long arms and, you know, shorter upper body, it ended up working for me. Sometimes I end up pulling technique like a taller person, only because of the longer arms. You know, it really helped out. So kind of found my sweet spot with that. So I'm, pretty, I'm very happy with squats. I'm very happy with the squats. And the pressing, I, I had to learn that with pressing, you got to do it more than once or twice a week, some, in some shape, form, or fashion. And so 
therefore, it didn't necessarily hit those numbers, like with 225 for five. You know, got up to 185 for three, and then life got in the way. Just started everything, putting the house up for lease, moving, all this other crap. And so then, oh, when life gets in the way, that's when everything kind of is like, you know what, trying to hit these numbers and really get this hard work out and still trying to deal with life and all the other stressors and everything like that and manage that is not necessarily going to be to my benefit. So it's always like this. Take care of life and know that the gym is still going to be there. And then go in with a clear head where you're not thinking about other stuff or being interrupted. And, and I think that's a, a big lesson for a lot of folks. They try to use the gym as therapy to get through life. And, you know, that's, that's good. But when you depend on the gym to get you through life, that's when it's a problem. You know, it should be yeah. an accessory. You know, it should be a, something that complements you, you know, working and, and navigating through life, not being the sole purpose of doing that, the, the sole, you know, mechanism and, and tool to get you through it. So, it's like I said, it's been a very interesting, not only year, but the last six months. You know, I think that's been growth. It's, it's been great because it feels like going back to the gym, being young again, where it's all, everything's, a lot of things are so brand new. So a lot of old things are new again. And that's what makes it exciting. So it's not this mundane, run of the mill thing going to the gym like, oh, I got to go work out today. Where I'm like, okay, let's see what I, let's see what I discovered today. And let's see what I learned last week. If, you know, pretty much how I can improve on that. And I think that's how training should be. Yeah, you know, with regards to the learning stuff, and, and it's funny because I think about every time I have discussions like this one here, I think about the armchair experts who maybe do online clients only, and they don't train <laughs> themselves a lot, and they don't right. like they or ever, or ever <laughs> and they don't train, they don't train themselves, they don't train clients in person, and they just uh, maybe have online clients and they write articles or whatever. You know, and right. I think about how many of, like, here's an example. On my Twitter, for example, all I, like, whenever I tweet, I usually try to give, like, some kind of a tip or some kind of a little uh, rule of thumb about training that I can right. think of. Right. You know, mm -hmm. 60% of those tweets that I come up with and that, that the advice that I give comes from whether I had just been with a client or whether I'd just been at the gym myself. And like I see somebody doing something or I'm doing something myself and I realize something about how I feel when I do something. And then I, I decide to document. I decide to put it down and then let, and let people hear what I'm thinking, you know, and right. these are where like those are where those little tidbits and those like golden rules and stuff that you come up with from experience come from. Right. So when when people don't, you know, like uh, what's the word I'm looking for? They don't they don't practice what it is that they're preaching. I wonder where they even get their knowledge from, right. like how. <laughs> How right. much value is lost from not being a disciple of your own craft in a way, right? And um, I, I, right. I can't even, I can't even imagine. Well, those those like, are people what, who don't, they don't even have their own training system. They've just ripped off someone else's and then exactly. changed a few phrases. But they're, yeah. they're never talking from experience. So they'll, like for example, they would say, "Oh, you don't want to do round back deadlifts." They're not saying that from experience. They're saying that because they read it somewhere. And if they actually studied right. the deadlift, they realize that. It's not as simple as that because, for example, Bob Peebles, one of the best deadlifters ever, this guy weighed 165 pounds. And I think it was during the 1950s or 60s. I forget exactly what time period. But he could deadlift over 700 pounds. And he, he not only used a round back, he purposely used a round back because he yeah. felt that trying to keep a flat back was a waste of energy. It was a yeah, waste right. of energy to hold the bar in that position with your back flat. So he purposely let the the bar pull his shoulders into the socket as much as possible so that his back would round, and he would actually breathe out, not in, before each repetition. And he found this worked extremely well for him. Now, you uh, can't argue with the results. This is a guy who was weighed 165, right. 700. You don't want to necessarily try to duplicate his technique, but you can't argue with the fact that it worked extremely well for him. But it also makes you realize that not everything that these movement specialists say is 100% accurate either. There's gray areas here. So, like, so for example, if I remember one time I put up a clip of me deadlifting 525 for a few reps, and some idiot's like, oh, pretty good, but you know, your back was rounding a little bit. And, of course, this motherfucker has no clip of him doing anything. <laughs> you know, <laughs> nothing about his back. Right? Now, if this guy had actually ever done that much weight or something that is commensurate to difficulty for him, he would realize that that's what happens as a result of the weight. Right. It's easy to keep your back flat. When you're using something that's light for you, it's easy to use 100% perfect technique. Technique is not going to be perfect when the effort is intense enough. It doesn't mean that it should right. be sloppy, 
But a lot of times, if you try to make it perfect, that's going to improve. That's going to have a. That's going to put an impediment in your progress and performance as well. You know, I had a good friend who worked out with me all the time, and we would do kettlebell presses. And once one of his reps went slightly out of the pocket, it wasn't sloppy, but it went out of the pocket. He would cave. It, it was. You could just see his body break down there because in his mind, he's thinking, "Oh, that rep wasn't perfect." No, it wasn't perfect, but it was acceptable. So keep going. It was effective. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah, exactly. Active, exactly. And the question is, did you get hurt? <laughs> did you die? <laughs> you know, you got to pull the, the hangover question, but did you die? It was just like, okay. Yeah, don't necessarily repeat it for, you know, reps of five, you know, for five sets of five, but just know that you made it, okay, and you got that you, you got that rep in. So you hit that number. Well, when you have to apply it in life, right, like we all like, we all, we all like the idea that a lot of the workouts we do has some benefit in life, when in, in reality it's, it's going to be a rare situation where we have to use the equivalent of, Strength for a 500 to 600 pound deadlift in any life situation. You know, maybe your wife exactly. got stuck under the car. Your wife got stuck <laughs> under the car. The side of the road got to pick it up. You know, how likely? Well, how the hell does she get under the car? Right. <laughs> how does she? How does she get under well, the like, car? Is the question. I like the overhead. I like the overhead press. That part of life. I like the overhead press because it carries over to me putting my bags overhead in the plane. Well, what the fuck are you taking with you? Okay. Do right. I need to have the? <laughs> So I, I mean, so, so I was like, man, thank God I worked on pressing double eighty eights ten times because that really carried over to my you know, my ability to put a bag overhead on the plane. A bag overhead on the plane should probably weigh five pounds or less. Okay, you should be able to yeah. fill that up with your. <laughs> you know? But so a lot all of, of times this... people talk about. So talk, a lot of times people talk about people realize like, well, what's the point of doing any of this? Because it doesn't carry over to real life. Well, what's the point of doing anything? Things are only meaningful <laughs> if we apply meaning to it. I mean, it's meaningful to me, and that's why I do it. I want to deadlift 600 pounds because I exactly. find it meaningful. I, I, not because I'm going to make more money off of it, not because more people are going to buy my supplements, because I find it meaningful, and that's enough. All of this all of this is incredibly true, and it's something that I've been actually preaching for the majority of this year as well is, number one, being able to bridge the gap between having your nose buried in the science books, which is good, but at the same time, having that and having, like, first-hand experience doing stuff to realize that the science books actually don't have the answer to every last thing with regards to training and exercise and fitness and all that sort of thing, right? And uh, it's just a, it's a hard truth that a lot of people don't want to come to terms with. And especially when, like what you were saying about five minutes ago, what you're saying with regards to when somebody will, if somebody comes into the gym and you train them and they do a set of bicep curls and they tell you that they feel it only in their calves and that's it. You know, like what do you do then when every book and every course and every college program and every university course and whatever has said bicep curls, will you will feel it here and this is the correct form and you're following everything to the T and they say they feel it in their tibialis anterior and that's it. You know, like there are always going to be exceptions to these rules that people are making and whatnot and the sooner that yeah. people – uh, realize that no two bodies are the same and that people are different, um, that this is going to, and that certain things are going to work better for you versus for somebody else, et cetera. You know, if, whether it's a foot stance, whether it's a grip width, whether it's a grip uh, style, et cetera, like those, those are all variables that can largely influence the, the efficacy of your training. Um, and with regards to the other thing that you were saying, uh, just more about experience and, and, uh, uh, just uh, people people going into the gym and, and lifting and they have to recognize that there's training for fitness and health and longevity and long term you know sustainable fitness and what and whatnot and right. then there's training because and then there's continuing to train for mm -hmm. PRs and whatnot for the hobby aspect of this of this game and right. I'm a part of right. that game we're all a part of that game for what I from what I understand here. Uh, like lifting 600 or 700, like there's absolutely no need to have to be able to do that. There isn't. If you if you want to get through life, there's people who never lift in their lives, <laughs> you know. So if you want to get yeah. from yeah. one place to another and be mobile and whatnot, how much actual direct lifting strength do you need by training it in the gym for PRs and so on? Who knows what the real number is, but I know it's not 700 pound deadlift. I know it's not that, you know, <laughs> and uh, like you were saying with the carry on overhead luggage and all that stuff and the, the, the overhead press and whatnot, like there's no transferability beyond a certain point 
for any of these lifts to be so freakishly strong. But we do this because we like what we do and we want to push our limits, et cetera, et cetera. And we want to see new PRs and it, it brings us joy and, and so on. And it's, a, it's a good thing for our psychology, et cetera. But beyond, uh, beyond a certain point, people need to recognize and admit that they're doing this for the recreational hobby aspect of it and not for, okay, I need direct health benefits because I have weakness and I need to get stronger. And so, you know, like stopping everything, because like a lot of strength and conditioning guys, they're like huge into, okay, but how is this going to benefit my strength? I don't know how it's going right, to benefit. Right. Well, dude, you're already in terrific shape. You're already athletic. If you stopped lifting entirely for a whole year right now and then came back cold and did a deadlift right now for your max, <clears throat> that number would still be higher than everybody else in this room, you know? So it's not like it's going to all disappear the second that you take three weeks off of training for heavy triples, you know? Right. There's benefit in right. doing stuff for a set of 10. There's benefit in doing uh, mobility circuits. There's benefit in doing all sorts of different styles of training if, you're already, if you've already taken years to develop this foundation and this base of foundational strength through the lifts that you're supposed to, to, to improve and so on, you know, and people yeah. are worried about having their 600 pound deadlift drop off to 535, you know, because of the <laughs> fact that they decided to do some, some agility work for a couple of weeks or whatever, you know, and it's, right. it's just funny right. because people need to broaden their perception and the perspective of what this should all be about. Would you rather deadlift yeah. 700 pounds and last three years doing that until you get hurt? Or would you rather deadlift, 350 pounds and have be able to do that until you're 78 or 85 or whatever, right, you know, right, like right. Uh, I would choose the latter. I don't know about everyone else, but that's me. Well, I also think that's why taking a longer approach to hit your goal will allow you to sustain that performance for a lush, much longer period of time. Your body adapts to it every step of the way. And then when you finally achieve it, it's there to stay. While with these rapid gains in size and strength, they're often very difficult to hold on to. Yeah. Yeah, people are people are greedy, and people they also are they're they want every result right now, and you know it sort of yeah. transcends an idea of hard work or putting in the time, and um, you know like things in social media and things that influence people's thinking towards these things as well, and social media and just in the internet in general, it can really really sort of uh, perpetuate that thinking and you know gimmick. Well, people focus don't on help either. people focus on expectations too much. I, mean, I just tweeted something about that because I had a guy email me about some article I wrote years ago. He just, I just answered a few questions and then he goes, "Okay, what can I expect to achieve on this after eight weeks?" And I said, "I said nothing." <laughs> you know, I was like, I was like, I was like, you shouldn't expect anything to happen. I go, you should go into this program with a focus on excellence in the performance stage during the process, and then you're going to be happy happy with the results. I go, but expectations are stupid. I go, it's stupid to have expectations on anything. That's the biggest mistake I see in our community is because it sells magazines, it sells articles, it sells programs. People want to have these clearly defined expectations met. They go, 50 pounds on your bench, bench press in eight weeks. Okay, well, what if you only had 20? Does that mean the program sucked? No, it's still a progression exactly. forward. I go, it said 50, and I only got 20. <laughs> you know, exactly. it's, it's like <laughs> it's like the meme that says, you know, to my even if you had slow progress, you know, you still made progress. And that's the thing about it. People don't focus; they just focus on the slow part. Like, well, man, it's not happening fast as I thought. Yeah, but you still progress. You're still 20 pounds stronger with your lift than you were two weeks ago. <laughs> but there's always that yeah. one person. Yeah, but I'm like, here we go. There's the yeah, but. <laughs> <laughs> Those yeah buts, man. <laughs> Anytime someone says yeah, but you know whatever comes next is going to be nonsense. It's not going to be good, man. It's never going to be good. <laughs> yeah, but, but I think expectations are a waste of energy. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't have a clearly precise goal as we all had because you have a target that you're going after. But once I had a goal, I was like, okay, that's what I'm going after. Now I'm going to focus on excellence in the process and see where this whole thing pans out. And how it panned out is I'm closer to every goal I set out. Some of them I'm, I'm going to hit. Some of them I'm not going to, but I'm closer to each one. And that, to me, is a, is a success, and that's motivating. And I think going back to what you said, a lot of us like to have these goals because, one, they're fun. But, two, I'm the kind of guy that needs purpose 
for working out. I don't want to just go work out and fuck around. You know, like some people I know, they they grab a kettlebell and they go juggle it in the park. <laughs> you know, and that's that's their workout. You know, they just do fun stuff. They're kind of just dicking around, as I call. It. They have these dicking around workouts. They don't really have a plan for any workout at all, and that's fun to do every once in a while. But this is just the way they train year in and year out. I notice yeah. people like that never really make any meaningful progress. Not in strength. Not in size. Not in not in in fat loss. Not appearance. Nothing. So I, I, I don't like to leave things to chance. I want to have a cl- clearly defined goal, and then I have purpose at each workout. And then I also take time to just get vacations from the gym, if you will, where you say, okay, I'm going to take two weeks off and just go hiking. I'm not going to touch the weights at all. I'm going to take a mental break from that. So I'm not so attached to it that every workout has to be purpose-driven, but the majority of them are because that's what keeps me focused and I'm a guy who's been working out hard since I was 18. I'm 43 now. A lot of people, if they don't have a clearly defined goal, it's easy to miss those workouts. It's not important now because they don't, they don't really know why they're working out. So it's easy to miss when you don't have a strong priority. Yeah. You know, I think about, I think about, you mentioned your age there, and I think about the difference in the way that I trained when I was 20 or 21 <laughs> versus I'm almost seven minutes away from being 30 years old. So like, the difference between being 21 and 30 and how I trained and what the differences are there. And I wanted to ask, like, with both of you guys, like, how differently do you train now versus when you were in your early 20s, let's say, or like the first three to five years that you touched weights? Well, I mean, Mike and I were talking about this on a premium episode that, you know, we're I'm at that point now where I don't feel the need to have to train four to five days a week in order to make certain gains. In fact, I've realized now that I've taken a little bit more time in between my training days that my gains have been a lot better and my recovery has been even sweeter because during those days off, I'm really focused on recovery. And so now the the things have switched where when I was younger, it was all about going hard, lifting, 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 lifting in very minimal recovery, very minimal recovery. You know, recovery for me was just the day I wasn't just the time that I was in the gym within that next 24 hours. You know, whereas yeah. now it's just like I'm constantly thinking about recovery. I'm constantly l- trying to make sure that, okay, I got a massage this time around. I actually want to do more meditative walk. I want to do the meditative fasted walk in the morning and, you know, and do three to five miles of that with my dogs first thing now. And that's my, like my real focus now that I've moved because I'm in an environment where, you know, it's, it's, it's really easy to do that without any interruption. <clears throat> and also just, you know, sometimes I just want to just take like a little staycation or a vacation. Like, hey, man, I, I just want to go here, travel here. And then when I get there, I want to see where all the walking trails are, hiking trails. You know, I want to see where, you know, I want to see if they have a spa in a hotel or something like that. I'm really thinking about recovery all the time. And I've noticed that that's truly helped my training game big time. With now that I've made that a big time priority. In fact, I feel like sometimes I make the, the recovery more of a priority than the lifting because it's now to the point where if I make the recovery my priority, the lifting is just now a symptom of that. It just becomes an accessory that came along with it. I didn't even have to really work that hard to think about how I got to go in and train hard in the gym. It's just like, no, I don't have to think about how hard it is. It's just like it's something I really want to do now. I'm not burned out. I'm not sitting there dreading like, God, man, it, I just started this training program. Is it week four yet? I need that recovery week. I should be thinking about the right. recovery week, the first week of a training program. And I used to be like that. And I'll, I'll look at certain things like, even like with Fire 3 1 or whatever, it's like, man, I can't wait to get to that recovery week. Good Lord. Whereas now I'm kind of like with the recovery week, like, I'm kind of, kind of telling myself, okay, you don't have to do anything that hard. It's, you get, have fun, enjoy it. But at the same time, there's a little twinge like, you know, but we could go ahead and just try this one time and not feel bad about it. So, you know, it feels good to be in that place, but, and, and and not feel guilty that you're not training four or five days a week. And I think that's another thing you kind of touched on a minute ago. It's just like when you just feel like, okay, I got to go. I got to do this. I got to go hard. got to go hard. And, you know, or I'm going to end up missing this or, I'm you know, I'm going to lose my gains here or, you know, I might end up losing five or ten pounds. So what if I do? So if I yeah. lost five or ten pounds off that lift, that tells me something. But let's, instead of freaking out and trying to fix it, you know, you know, sit there and analyze that. Like, okay, why is that? Maybe you shouldn't have been at that number so so fast in the first place. You didn't give yourself right. time. It's kind of like people have rapid weight loss and then they have a bunch of extra skin. He's like, okay, yeah, you lost all that all that weight, but now you got all this fucking skin <laughs> flapping in the wind right now. You're looking like black sails when you walk around. So, you know, so you got to ask yourself, was it worth it? <laughs> you know, because now you've done that. Now you got to go get skin surgery. So, I mean, so right. you got to really ask yourself, how healthy are you now at this point? 
So, like I said, you got to give your body that time to like, okay, this is what we're doing, and I can appreciate that. And let me help you out, big guy, by go ahead and telling these cells to adapt and get ready for what we go- got going on here. Instead of you trying to spring it on me like, hey, we're going to go for this 600-pound deadlift, whether you like it or not. And the body's like, oh, I don't like it, and guess what? We're not getting there because I'm the one that's in control. <laughs> so, yeah. man, that, that's one of the benefits I see, man, just kind of really, you know, just I'm not in a hurry. That's the thing about right. it, to sum everything up. So what's the point, you know? Well, I mean, I think at least my perspective is it's not it's not age related any changes I've made. It's more mileage related. So I've been working out a lot longer. Now hor- hormonally, because I'm really into hormone optimization, and making sure that hormonal profile is optimal. I'm, I'm healthier now than I was when I was 30. I didn't pay attention to it back then, so I would drive myself into the ground with lack of sleep and training too often, too hard. And then I was just starting my business around that age too. I was just getting things going. So that was a lot of different stresses coming at me at different angles. Now my, my now now stress in my life is very low. You know, I'm much more financially set. I'm much more confident at this age. So you just don't have the same stress as you used to have when you were much younger. So as a result, less energy dissipation on stuff like that that can be sent towards more positive measures such as your workouts and so forth. Like sincere I pay attention to recovery a lot more. Like I didn't get weekly massages when I was thirty one. I couldn't afford to. And two, even if I could afford it, I, I wouldn't see the reason to do it like sincere. Like a recovery day was just not working out that day. You know, that's, that's the way I looked at it, too. It meant that you watched a couple extra shows on HBO or something, kick, kick back on the couch. Even then, you're up thinking you, you couldn't wait to get back into working out the next day. So I'm at, oh, but, but now I'm more focused on recovery, not so much because of age, but again, because of mileage. I'm, I lift a much heavier now than I did when I was 30, and that takes a much bigger toll on my body. Oh. So it's so it's interesting. A lot of people always talk about their age and it's more because they just screwed up the last twenty <clears throat> years and they're in this really right. deleterious state. It's because of the way they live their their life that they can't do a lot of yeah. things that they would to do, not because of their age per se. So that's one thing. When I was twenty eight I used to look at people that were forty. I was like, God, those guys are old, man. I was like forty. <laughs> and these guys would always say stuff like, Oh, you know, wait till you're my age. When I was twenty five, people that were thirty, like, oh man, wait till you hit thirty. And it's downhill from there. And I used to be I used to be like really demoralized about that. I was like, shit, man, I'm gonna start getting weaker when I'm thirty. <laughs> you know? It's gonna be a long fifty years, time. man. <laughs> at 30, I felt good. Then, then in my early thirties, someone would see me lifting heavy kettlebells at the park in Santa Monica and they'd be like, Oh man, wait till you hit forty and I'd be like, Oh shit, I guess I guess forty is the number where things are gonna suck. And the reason why these people have these these attitudes like that is they never took care of themselves, in particular your hormonal health. You know, your hormonal health is your systemic health. So if you take care of your hormonal health, I'm not saying you're going you're to be strong for the rest of your life, but you're going to be strong and healthy and vibrant and have a high sex drive and feel good for a much longer period. So getting that stuff dialed in, I'm just more – I just don't waste time with training because I got other shit to do. <laughs> you know, that's the other thing is I'm, my attitude is if I can get better results with two workouts per week, why am I working out six times a week? I used to work out five, six yeah. times a week when I was younger because I thought I would get results faster as a result of doing yeah. that. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not so sure that was even true. I think, I think if I worked out less frequently then, I would have had better results. Not, I'm not just working out less frequently now because I'm older. I just think it's actually more effective. You're one, the, the heavier you lift – the less often you can actually do that. So it's all these things. To That's what we were experience. sold, Mike. We were sold that in those, those fitness magazines, especially in our 20s. You know, we had like Muscle Fitness and all these other magazines that we thought were like, okay, these were the go-to magazines. And we were sold that, not knowing, you know, because we weren't in the industry yet, not knowing that there was – being very divisive with a lot of that stuff. We didn't realize that a lot of those were to sell products and supplements and base it around that. And also – putting it around a more bodybuilder style workout where it's really focused on aesthetics and not necessarily focused on getting stronger. You can get strong, but not focused on getting stronger and, and really building from that. This is all about. Well, I'm happy look. to say, actually, I didn't, you know, even in my early twenties, I was reading Brooks Kubrick's dinosaur training. I was a big fan of Charles Poliquin, Louis Simmons. So I, I knew how to train really well at as young as 25, even in college, I was always into keeping workouts under 45 minutes, four to five times a week. You know, but, but 
So I, I never fell into that whole high volume bullshit where you do five different chest exercises and ten different <laughs> right. bicep exercises. I mean, I did what I, I mean, was if a you're going, If you're going by how you feel, something was will tell you like, you know, this feels stupid. You know, you can like, okay, I can't even like, like you know, you're sitting there, you're trying to do like one more freaking fly, and you're like, I can't move my. Why is my chest? Why is my chest collapsing and convulsing at the same time? So something. Right. Was just, and you never, if you were actually never listening to your body. Big. You never see anyone big and powerful training like that either. Like at the gym no. I go to, I'll do a full no. body workout, deadlifts, weighted pull ups, glute ham raises, incline presses, kettlebell swings. I just go through the whole gam, the whole program, and the kids next to me are on their fourth chest exercise. And do they have an impressive <laughs> upper body as a result? No, <laughs> you know, <laughs> because they're just wasting time on volume. You know, you do a few things really well. So fortunately, I was tuned into more abbreviated training in the sense of time, but I just thought that frequency was more important than it, than I think it actually is. And in some things, frequency is important. Like I press, I do kettlebell pressing five, six days a week, different sets throughout the day, nowhere close to failure. So I just find like sincere said, you got to do pressing more often to improve. Well, something like deadlifts, I'm finding that once a week is the most I should be doing it. And now I'm experimenting with every 14 days or every 10 to 14 days and seeing how that goes now that I'm deadlifting much heavier. And so far, so good. I haven't been doing it long enough to say certainly that it's the great way to go, but so far, so good. So I, th I think you just get smarter with training because even if you have the time, like I, I could train six days a week now if I wanted to. I've got all the time in the world to train. Hell, I could train two day times a day, six days a week if I wanted to right now. But I don't because it's not useful. Like I said, if I'm going to get better results with two solid weight training workouts per week, then anything beyond that that's not going to get me better results is a waste of time. And like Sincere right. said, also, a lot of people, the gym is their, is their therapist. You know, we know people who have three gym memberships and they work out six days a week and they probably they they probably need to see a therapist if they took a week off from trading. You know? exactly. <laughs> so and in all that it. time, they haven't gotten any stronger. They they look the same. They they're still lifting the yeah. same. It's like, oh, all those memberships. That's as strong as you're going to get. Really? Well, they don't they don't <laughs> train for strength. They don't they don't train for strength. They train for well, the stimulus exactly. of out. And it's usually someone who's focused on body composition. So just like someone who's got an eating disorder, they have a body morph disorder. What they see in the mirror is not there. So they need they feel like they need to keep working out often. And then they eat a piece of cake. They're on the treadmill 10 minutes later. They have this guilty <laughs> like, oh, man, I just had some pizza. Now I got to go run hill sprints. I'm like, okay, good luck with that. I'm like, first of all, I don't want to be downwind when you do that, okay, because you just finished that pizza. But. <laughs> so, yeah, well, yeah. you know. Hill, so that's well, people who train for performance, performance is very black and white. Either you're getting stronger or you're not. And if you're not, then you're doing something wrong. So that's why I like you just up a very You brought up a very interesting word, you know, that should not be your motivator in anything you do. Guilt. Okay, that's like the worst that's the worst motivator in anything because trust me, no matter what you do, it's never gonna Guilt is insatiable. It'll always find another reason to be around, no matter what. So even if you do do 10 heel sprints after having a couple slices of pizza, guilt's going to tell you something else. It's like, well, I mean, you actually just had that pizza like an hour ago, so you probably want to do about five more heel sprints because of this, this, and this. It'll always find another reason to, to make you feel crappy. So guilt should never be your motivator for anything, man. It's it, like... I, I believe it was in your book, Mike. It's like it's it's no, it's no. It was actually jealousy, but guilt's right up there with that. It's a wasted emotion. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, just yeah, to yeah, even feel that. You know, I'm like, I, yeah. I, I I laugh at people when they just like, well, you know, I feel guilty. I'm like, why? To my, I'm like, you know, just you shouldn't, you shouldn't feel guilty because a, no one's perfect. So when you make peace with that, including yourself, when you make peace with that, then guilt goes right out the door. You know, and so yeah, man, it's like the worst thing. I, I never want to go not, in. Well. Also, not being well calibrated because you actually you did it. You actually wanted to do it, and you did it. So why are you guilty? <laughs> right. You actually wanted to do it. <laughs> right. You, you should be thinking about now. If you don't like that you did it, you should be thinking about why. What's underlying? Why? What's the underlying reason for why you're acting this way? And why did but you do it anyway? Why were you rebellious? You know. <laughs> so, yeah, man. It's like it's like someone is someone gets caught cheating, right? And the person's always like, "I'm sorry." It's like, "No, you're sorry you got caught." Got caught. You're not sorry. <laughs> exactly. You're not sorry you did what you did because you wanted to do that. Hell, you looked like you were enjoying it. You know when I walked in on you. <laughs> but uh, so you're not sorry you did it, but you're sorry you got caught doing it. You know, you have to. That does not look like someone that looked like they were sorry. I'm like, you, were, <laughs> you were grinning ear to ear, looking around like almost like you had an audience. Like, yeah, man, I wish my boys could see this. That didn't look like that didn't look like you were sorry, bro. <laughs> 
<laughs> but on the so, side I mean, note, when you talk about the people that... you got to be honest, though. This is someone who's not well calibrated, right? So when you're not well calibrated, <laughs> you're you're very good at lying to yourself. But at, at the end of the day, you can't lie to yourself. You're lying. You're just lying to the other person with your explanation. But it's and you th- and you're thinking you're lying to yourself, but you know why you do stuff. So don't kid yourself. Right. And I think another thing, Lee, is just the fact that you know with these type of folks, it's beyond the guilt. It's also about bragging rights. They 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 train, yeah. they have all these memberships, they do all these workouts yeah. just so they can let the world know that they right. have been working out two or three times today. And they think, hurry up, get that selfie up to show you that they were yep. in the gym. So or they like to go and tell their coworkers, oh, you know, I was with my trainer Lee, and they didn't even show up that day. You know, <laughs> they get canceled <laughs> on you. But they they always talk about their personal trainer Lee Boyce, like, oh, my trainer's the best, but they never show up for fucking class. They never show up for yep. their session. But they love to talk about their trainer. You know, even though they haven't seen him in like a week or a month, you know, so it's all yeah. about the bragging rights because they want to let the world know, like, look, I'm, it's, it's all about I'm better than you. You're sitting on your ass. I have a trainer. Yeah, but you're sitting I on wish, your ass and you're paying for a trainer. <laughs> so. I wish that I could eliminate somehow the the whole aura of competition and hardcore that sort of permeates all the gyms, at least in my area, you know, and. Yeah. You know, even when you walk into certain gyms and you're getting the mean mug from all these people who are, <laughs> right. you know, just they're they're in, they're in their animal mode, they're in beast mode, so you can't bother them and all that sort of thing. Like, listen, right. I get being focused for a good hard workout, but when you can't be pleasant anymore, that is the part <laughs> right. where I'm just like, you're putting on a character right. now, and you don't need to do that. You know. <laughs> um, but uh, and then, and then you know, the flip side of that though is people that want to see you fail in the gym, right? Like a lot of times you're going for a PR. Like people are looking and they're hoping they that you're stuff down. They're waiting. Make, yeah, it's an no, because it'll make them it'll make them feel better about themselves. Like, oh man, that guy just tried to deadlift five fifty and he bombed. Man, he totally yeah, missed yeah, that one, right? But of course, so you feel I, good about I actually like using that. that so. Well, I mean, that stuff. I like using that. Sometimes it's an illusion. It's not even there, but you can make it there to your better man. So sometimes when I'm about to go for a PR, I'm like, oh yeah, look at these people looking at you. They want to see you fucking fail. They want to see you fuck it up, and that just gives me extra fuel. To pick it up, and then you know, I do what I call the Andrew Dirty Ed. Like Andrew Dirty Ed's our friend, where he lifted something really heavy one time, and he's like looking to the left and right with his like sticking his tongue out, like "fuck you guys." You know, like that kind of look. <laughs> sometimes I do that. It's sometimes it's warranted, right? Like sometimes you can see the look on people go, "Oh, that guy's not going to be able to lift that. He's going to fuck it up." Other times it's totally in your head, but. It doesn't matter because you can use it as energy to make sure that you complete something. Like the other day, I was about to – it was last week. I was doing deadlifts for 545, right? And I was about to do my last set. And I was like, okay, the first two reps went pretty good, but this this one's going to be a gut check because your, your nervous system's fried. And then this good-looking girl with the little short shorts came in, and she was basically like right behind me. So now is she looking in my direction at all? Not one bit. You know, She doesn't care whether I lift this or not. She doesn't care about me at all. But in my mind, I was like, well, I don't want to look stupid in front of her, even though who cares if I look stupid in front of her? She's not, it's not like I'm going to go hit on her afterwards or she's going to come try to talk to me because she saw me do a heavy deadlift. Right? But in my head, I was like, I don't want to look dumb in front of her. So I used that to make sure I completed the lift, which I did. So in other words, you can, you can use these psychological tricks. A lot, of, a lot of strength training is psychological tricks. It's using really? mental trick tips to just trick yourself and to be more powerful, potent, and confident. Sure. Absolutely. You know, it's funny how much motivating, how much uh, motivating factor uh, other people around you are. And, you know, in some cases to the detriment, in some cases to the advantage. Like, I, I like thinking about staying in my own lane when I do my workouts and trying to not necessarily block everybody out, but really try to focus on running my own race rather than running uh running someone else's funny story i was uh deadlifting early this year really early this year and it was around the point where i was getting close to that 550 and um i i was doing uh my goal my plan for the day was to do i think i was my plan for the day was to hit five plates so 495 on the on the deadlift and do like you know whether it was a set of 3 or whatever it was i can't remember anyway so the workout was going smoothly, and then in comes another dude who comes in. He looked like he was a few years older than me, and he was uh, he was deadlifting, and he set up. There's a there's a busy gym, so he set up his deadlift bar right next to mine. He was right beside me, <laughs> and you know he was facing one direction, I was facing the opposite <laughs> direction, and like every time. <laughs> so every this time. So hilarious right now. <laughs> So every I mean, time you, you, I was, he was he was next he was next to you, not right in front of you, right? Like he's in your field no, of vision, no. or he's on to the side. That would have been really about, funny. 
He was about 10 feet away from me to my left is what it was. Okay. You know? Okay. Because so, face to face so was very it. awkward. <laughs> Like face to face, I'm like, like, like what, do you, what do you want to do at the top? Kiss? You know what I mean? We, we pull in unison. <laughs> oh, that would be very yeah. <laughs> So anyway. <laughs> so yeah, no. So he's, he, sets up, he sets up next to me and he does his thing. And, uh, you know, every time I was resting was when he would do a set to respect the, you know, the line of vision and the focus and everything like that. And every time I was, uh, I was uh, doing a set, he'd be resting, et cetera. But it just makes you be a fly on the wall to watch the other person's set as he starts getting heavier and heavier with his lift. And so his strength was comparable to my strength as well. And so it was a point in time where he was up around, he was up 455 and he pulls that for a clean single. And so I do my set, I'm at 455 and I do my triple. And then he does 475 and he does another single. And so I hit 475 and I do my triple. So my next set's supposed to be my last set and I was doing my triple. And he, so I did it and then he does 495 and he does his single. And then I see him go up to 505. And he does a single. So I'm like, well, it looks like my workout's changing. <laughs> and so I put on 505. Yeah. I do a trip. Yeah. And so it went up, and I ended up finishing that workout at 525 when I was in that, had no intention of doing this, right? But you know, I felt that I had to for some reason, you know? And, you know, it's that, just that's like a good that thing. Could, that's a good thing is where I'm going. See, that, that, that's a positive competitive drive, right? Because it's not like you're trying to show him up where, like, after you did that set, you're like, huh, see that? It was more <laughs> like you're using – it was it was a healthy competitive drive, and I think that's one of the benefits of going to a gym where other people are working out because you have that group energy. You're working out, they're working out. There's kind of a symbiotic relationship. Even if even if they're not working out as seriously as you are, everyone's there to work out to whatever they, degree they feel is sufficient for them, and there's some you can feed off of that to your betterment. Yeah, so basically, yeah. Emily, you were playing deadlift poker. It's like every time he went to <laughs> one, you raised you raised him three. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was it. That was it. You should, you should have hustled the guy. You should have barely pulled 405 and been like, man, you know, I'm just, <laughs> I'm just feeling awesome. And then, then you should have gone to him and be like, hey, man, I bet you 100 bucks. You know, I can match you for the rest of the workout. You know? <laughs> now you're making lifting fun and profitable. Pull a, pull a Forrest Whitaker in the – Pull a Forrest Whitaker in The Color of Money when he hustled Paul Newman. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Great movie, in case anyone hasn't seen it. That's a classic. You're a big, you're a big movie buff too, Lee. I notice you're always talking, you're always posting about movies. Is that one of your leisure activities? Oh yeah, it's uh, if you want to call something a hobby, watching movies is definitely a hobby of mine. I uh, have only been getting into them, to be honest, since around 2010 or 11. So it's been the last like five, six years that I've been really into it, yeah. and. Uh, yeah. You know, now I'm checking out at least one per week, you know, and the new mm-hmm. stuff. And then I always brush up on the old stuff I haven't seen yet and so on. I actually went on a Paul Newman binge this summer. <laughs> Funny <laughs> you say that. Yeah. He has a lot of good movies. He has a lot of good movies. Did lot, you see the, did yeah, you watch, did you watch The Hustler? How far back did you go? Yeah, I saw The Hustler. I've seen Cool Hand That's Luke. Great. I saw uh, The Verdict, go. which I actually really liked as well. Yeah. You know, he had some, he had some good stuff, man. He did. Oh, yeah. He did. I find that a lot of training, not not a lot, but a lot of training professionals I know like movies because sometimes you even go by yourself because it's an environment where you shut off your phone, you're not yep. talking to anybody, and for those two hours you're just immersed in this fictitious world, escaping yep. everything around. So there's something relaxing about is, that. Uh, it's it is exactly it's dark, so no it. one's tempted. Yeah, it's dark. No one's tempted to try to talk to you, you know. And, <laughs> right. You, and and the, the cool thing is, go see some see something controversial where people really are, you know, like feeling uncomfortable, you know. Like you know, you go and you see something like Twelve Years a Slave, and you're like the only black guy in the theater, which is always funny to me. <laughs> like because especially when the movie's over and you go to the restroom, everybody's kind of like being very polite. I'm just like, oh yeah. I'm like no, no, you you go ahead, you go ahead, you take the girl, you go ahead. I'm just like, like dude, it's okay, man. It's, <laughs> <laughs> to my, to my, to my urinals are not part of reparations. It's okay, dude. I'm not. They're apologizing for stuff that they would normally exactly. say without worrying about. Like, well, how about you apologize for not? <laughs> yeah, it's like here, here's the thing. How about you apologize for not washing your hands after you use the restroom? So like, let's not even worry about slavery, which had nothing to do with you. Let's talk about you right now not washing your hands. I'm more offended by that right now. Okay, well, that's something you can take care of in this moment. This fat dude at the Kings of Chaos concert at the House of Blue should have apologized for farting in front of everyone. Right? <laughs> well, hey, that was he like wanted to prove to you that he was the King of Chaos, Mike. Okay, that's what that was. <laughs> that was <so> much chaos. <laughs> just goes to show you, when people feel anonymous, they don't care. Yeah, they just exactly. people are only exactly. 
people are only polite when they feel like there's going to be a repercussion for being impolite. But in, in the context of a crowd, people are like, well, no one's going to know it's me. <laughs> you know? so and, gonna, and that actually, single-handedly describes social media right there. Yeah, exactly. 100%. 100%. <laughs> you made a funny point, Lee, about – you just made it today, I think, or I saw it on I saw it on Sincere's feed. He retweeted it. Where you're talking about how a lot of fitness professionals are always posting semi naked yeah. pics of themselves, and we're talking about dudes. Oh yeah, <laughs> you know? <It> incredible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that reminds me of our our friend Steve Maxwell. Steve Maxwell's a great guy. He's been on the show many times, and I've been friends with him for over a decade. But it's like, Steve, you're in your 60s, buddy. Stop posting pictures of you coming out of the shower. <laughs> Are you on the beach with speed? <laughs> I know walking. To somebody. I don't want to turn. On, I don't want to get on Instagram and the first thing I do is see a live feed of like Steve coming out of the shower with a towel on. Like, come on, man, don't do that. Oh, Claire, Claire, <laughs> it's kind of like that one Claire crazy Bass, uncle, at, at, you know, during Bass the holidays. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Clarence Bass in his book is like the first thing I do every morning is examine <laughs> my body naked in the mirror. <laughs> you know, like, dude, you're 75, man. Stop looking at yourself in the mirror. You know. <laughs> 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 oh, man. But that, but the problem, see, the thing is, is that a lot of people in the fitness community, if you don't look a certain way, people don't think you're knowledgeable. Now, I get it that if someone's fifty pounds overweight, I don't want to hear what they have to say either. Now, they could have some good information, but obviously they're not they're not practicing what they're preaching or what they're preaching is erroneous because there's no reason to be sloppy overweight. But at the same time. There are people that are just ripped to the bone, and people give them a lot more length than they should based Absolutely. on the fact that – Exactly. It's like how strong is this person? Or do they even – you know, or, what, or how are they eating? You know, my thing is what are they doing to get ripped to the bone? What are they doing to be at like 5% body fat all year round? You know, like is well, they, that, yeah. that their well, DNA well, or do they have a do they have an eating disorder again. where they're living their life off protein shakes and, and power bars, you know, all year right. round, you know, and they're afraid to even have one carb in their life, you know, including fruit. Because like, no, nah, man, can't have that. That's that's got fructose in it. I'm like, dude, <laughs> come on. People have been eating fruit since the beginning of time. In fact, if you, you subscribe to that, that's what got people in trouble in the first place, you know, in a certain little story, you know, from a Garden of Eden type situation. So don't act time, like this is something that just. Someone who's, at, uh, someone who's at a high, someone who's at a certain body fat percentage, let's say above 15 percent, you're just being lazy at that point because there's no benefit to being at a certain body fat percentage. You don't have to be five percent, but you shouldn't be 20 percent either. Right. You see, I think that this this issue of the general public kind of giving more attention to the ripped guy versus the person who's just in regular good shape is going to right. always be there unless the general public's knowledge base improves. And something that I've been talking about on other podcasts as well is that what we do as professionals, because there's a lot of good information. They could just say there's so much crap out there. There's so much crap out there. Well, there's a whole lot of good stuff out there as well, especially as the industry has matured in the last, let's say, 10 years or so, right? And it's just, yeah, okay, it might not be as saturated. Uh, the industry might not be as saturated, saturated with good stuff as it is with bad stuff. But the thing is, we already know that the biggest platforms more, more available more information than ever. Yeah. Right. And we already know the hugest platforms available are usually filled with fluffy fluffy people who are, you know, people who are spreading the wrong kind of things for gimmicky fitness trends and stuff like that. But until we make the general public our focal point and educate them, and we stop talking to each other about fitness because, you know, there's a lot of, you know, training seminars and fitness summits and this and that. And right. there's a lot of different things where the professionals congregate to each other and with each other and they'll have eight hour lectures and things like that. And those are all good. Those are all really good. But it's making a knowledgeable trainer more knowledgeable amongst other knowledgeable trainers. And then <laughs> right. the general public, you walk outside on the street and you ask somebody, show me where your lats are. And they don't know what that is. You know, like just a, a very basic level question or, you know, what you said earlier, you know, OK, can you touch your toes? Can you, you know, stand on one foot type of thing? And they can't do it because they don't even know how to get in shape to do stuff like that. Right. And until we can make somebody in the general public realize that the Tracy Anderson method, for example, is not something that can lead to great physical fitness. And this is not a smart way to go about your approaching your training. You know, they're going to look at the Tracy Anderson mm -hmm. method and look at Tracy Anderson and be like, oh, yeah, she right. must know what she's talking about. She's on TV. Jeez, like, let's do it. 
you know, whereas somebody uh, who has On the other knowledge, side, though, to, to contrast what you're saying, there are other people who just read Mel Stiff's super training, and now they're trying to be his clone every time they talk, where they make everything complicated to show how much they know. You know, that's the other yeah. extreme. Yeah, so they talk in language that is they, they, well. They they talk in language that is that only someone in the industry is even going to understand. Like, like they yeah. just read, they, they just got their anatomy checkbook, uh, textbook out. They're like, okay, I'm going to use all of these words when I talk today, and that's all fine and great, but no one understands what you're talking about. Okay. Going through. So I always yeah, feel you that someone who's a good your, someone who's a good audience. coach. Well, someone who's a good coach can take very complicated ideas and deliver them in a way that the average person can understand. That, to me, is always a clear understanding that that person understands what he or she is yeah. saying. Most people, most people yeah. don't even understand what they're saying. They're just repeating something, right? They don't, if you probe further, like someone will say, oh, you know, leptin resistance is a big problem. And you go, okay, well, what's leptin? Or, well, it's, it's a hormone. So well, what exactly does it do? And you, you start asking a bunch of probing questions, you realize that they just read a book and they're repeating something without a real clear understanding of even what they're saying. Right. Right. And getting back to what you were saying about the Tracy Anderson myth, another problem is that, you know, people are not necessarily looking to her. They're looking at her clients. They look at these celebrities and they always yeah. think these people are the embodiment of fitness. So when you get Cameron Diaz putting out a fitness book and then it is and it's number one on the New York Times bestseller, even though there's a lot of politics behind that, it doesn't mean it was because of sales. You know, it's because of, you know, it's knowing the right people. But when people see that, they're like, oh, my God, I got to get her book. And, you know, she's sitting on there half naked on the front cover, and she's trying to claim that, hey, because I'm doing all this, this is why I look like this, and not trying to, you know, throw in the other things like, well, I'm rich, and I can get my own personal chef. And basically, I have my, all my different babysitters to make sure that I'm held accountable, whereas the average person that's buying that book is, can nowhere close to even do, it, do that in their own life. Most of them can't, right. they probably can't even afford even having a personal trainer, you know, in the fact. So you got all these people, these celebrities trying to tell people, like, how to get fit, like, Mario Lopez. I'm like, yeah, can you also throw in all the plastic surgery that you're getting as well? You know, <laughs> don't don't leave that out, buddy. All the sucking and nipping and tucking that you've been doing as well. Don't get on there with your six pack abs and trying to say like, hey, use this method I've been using with my trainer. You know, same with LL or anyone else. It's like, come on, man. You guys, a lot of you guys are in a position where you can cheat a little bit. And look, man, if that works for you, fine. But don't lie to the people like, hey, you can look like this by doing the things that's written in this book by some ghostwriter, even though I'm claiming I'm the one that wrote it. But I'm the expert because I have to take care of myself when I'm doing this profession or whatever else. Like, no, man, you, you have a lot of professional babysitters. And you just right. need to be honest about that. And people also need to be, as you know, first of all, acknowledge the fact that that happens. Get out of your la-la land and thinking that, oh, I'm going to end up looking like LL when I buy this book. Okay, <laughs> good luck with that. You know, like, well, I can because this, this, and this. Like, okay, you do know that he cheats a little bit. He does have some nipping and some tucking, and he has his own trainer, and he's got his own chef. He can afford all that. So, no, nah, man, he no, nah, it's all natural. Okay. Well, yeah, that's the thing is that. The food that you eat, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so. And that's the thing, right? And once the general public can actually understand that these things are actually myths or these things are lies or they're not true or whatever, thanks to us, the people like us who can actually yeah. stop talking to each other and start talking directly to them. And they have a right. bigger, we have a bigger voice out there talking directly to the public as well. Well, then all of a sudden the information or the, the, the knowledge level is going to improve. And then, you know, it will push out people like, you know, the Andersons and all those kind of people with the gimmicky right. fitness trends. Mm -hmm. And because the average person won't buy it anymore, you know, and that should be, right. that's like the end goal in, in terms of what I'd like to see happen in the industry anyway, is that, you know, the public actually understands more about fitness than they currently do. And it doesn't mean a whole, has to be a whole lot more, but it has to be more. You know, they, they can they can be held accountable, too, for educating themselves properly and, and getting just a good base level knowledge the same way that you'd acquire a base level knowledge if you wanted to drywall your own home or you wanted to right. take, take your, your medicine in the proper doses or whatever. You, you do a little bit of research about it in a proper way. You know, you want right. legal assistance, you'll probably hire a professional or you'll read something, you know. So, yeah. Well, there's, I, there's I, more I, good sort of, information. There's more good information now than ever before probably on really any topic, but definitely on fitness. I mean, there's a ton of really good information. Like you said, there's a lot of crap, as there always has been, but there's a lot of really good information, too. Right. And anyone who has a connection can access it. So at this point, people have to start taking responsibility instead of blaming others for being misled. So you, you were greedy, too, and that's why you got misled. Someone told you you could have the body of your dreams in eight weeks with only an idiot would believe, but you chose to believe it. It didn't work, and now you're blaming the person for selling it to you. So, yeah, they shouldn't have lied to you, but you shouldn't have lied to yourself. That's what made you buy right. into that bullshit. 
It's kind of like the show American Greed, which we've talked to many times. They always talk about the person who screwed over other people. The part they always leave out in every single episode that I have seen is that the people that were screwed over were greedy as well. That's why they were susceptible to being manipulated. The only way you can right. manipulate someone is if they actually want to be manipulated. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah, basically they're upset because they pretty much they got caught being greedy. It goes back to what Lee was saying about cheating. <laughs> you know, they, they weren't feeling sorry or whatever else. They got, you know, or like you guys were saying, they got sorry they got caught. Well, the same thing with these people in American Greed. They got caught being greedy. And so now they try to take that victim and tell him, flip it, like, I can't believe they took advantage of me. Why not? <laughs> <It's> <laughs> my, you, <laughs> so my, you put yourself in a position to be taken advantage of. But, in fact, you try to take advantage of the system itself, and then it's just like, you know, karma dealt you a, a, a good hand. And you and you got what you put out there. That's how karma works, <laughs> you know. So you shouldn't be surprised. You've been like, first of all, when they come knocking on your door to say, "Hey, we want to film you for this episode." No, nah, I'm good because I learned my lesson, and there's nothing to talk about here. <laughs> it's just like I, I was greedy. So it's gonna be a very short segment if you come to interview me. Like, well, what happened to you? I was greedy. I got I I got exploited the way I try to exploit the system, and here we are. It doesn't make for good yep. TV. <laughs> you know, just like a lot of these fitness shows or whatever else. It's like these people are like truly honest and telling these people that come on these shows, being like 100% honest with them, these shows wouldn't last very long. The episodes would be very short. It's just like, oh, okay, so you want to lose 100 pounds in the next, what, four weeks before we have the season finale? <laughs> okay, cut, cut off an, a leg and an arm and do, and do a hell of an eight ball size crack ball. You know, just you know, do that. And do about 12 rows of Coke with Charlie Sheen. You'll be good. Like, wow, dude, that's, why would you say that? That's cruel. Oh, no cruel than what's going to happen to these people. At, uh, no cruel than what's going to happen to these people in the next six weeks on this show. So what's the point? By me telling them this or putting them through the murder you're going to put them through that's going to wreak havoc on their bodies and their mentality for the next six weeks. You saying I'm being cruel? They just cut off a freaking leg and do an eight ball? Come on, man. <laughs> so just say well, it doesn't I mean, everyone, make everyone, everyone involved is guilty there. Like the people who go on the show, they're stupid. The people on the show as trainers, they're stupid and unqualified. And the people watching those shows are also part of the problem because they're improving the ratings. So I don't feel right. sorry for anyone involved. I don't feel sorry for any of those three parties. You know, they all deserve each other. Like the trainers, they suck. If you're willing to sell your soul to get on some stupid show and make money and be a celebrity as a trainer, you, you want to feel like you're an A-list Hollywood person. That that's the price you pay. You want to you want to be someone who's been 300 pounds your whole life, and you're going to go lose it all in 12 weeks, and you think you're going to be healthy. You deserve what you get on that show. And if you're someone who's who has nothing better to do but watch these stupid ass shows at home, you know you're not going to get any sympathy from me either. Well, so it kind of goes these three. It kind of goes back to like what we. It goes back to what Lee was saying. It's kind of like in the gym. It's kind of like people kind of they're watching these shows to watch these people's downfall. Yeah, they know that somebody's yeah, going to win right. the show. But but the big payoff is when the show is over, they can't wait. So they'll know who the winner is. So when they see that winner comes, and they see him in the tabloids or whatever else, and they've gained, they lost 100 pounds, but then they came back and they lost, I mean, they gained 200 pounds. That makes people <laughs> at home watching like, so the people at home watching can say like, you know what, I remember when I saw them win, and now look at them now. So they can have that discussion about it because it makes them feel a little yeah. bit better about their own life. Like, well, at least I, I didn't go lose 100 pounds and come back with 200. <laughs> I, I didn't wait. I didn't waste my time dieting. You know, I, I enjoy yeah, it. Waste your time so watching that time show. <laughs> yeah, you, you know why? Because you were eating chips and cookies while you were watching the show, a weight loss show. That's why you didn't waste your time dieting. Well, you, you, always, you always have to look at details in a many contexts. Right? I'll give two examples. One is someone says, I put 100 pounds in my squat. And you're like, wow, that's great in a year. Now, they leave out the part where they started using a really thick weightlifting belt. That alone will add 30, 40 pounds to your squat, if not more. And then they start wearing a squat suit in the combination of those two. And they stopped three inches above parallel. They left those three right. things out of context. So you always have to take, whenever someone says something, you have to look at the details a little bit further instead of just buying into it. Like, oh, wow, what did you do? 100 pounds? What program are you on? It's like, no, I don't care about what program are you on. Come on, no. What did you, what did you start changing differently? Well, well, Tim Ferriss is another example. Technique. They're doing the Tim super Ferris technique, say, face down, ass up. So that's what that Tim is. Tim Ferriss will say, I, like I, right. Tim Ferriss will say, oh, I, I can deadlift 500 pounds. Now, the part that he leaves out is that it's on a Smith machine, and it's two inches from lockout. <laughs> okay, so be, exactly. <laughs> hey, man. Tony, Rob, detail, Tony Robbins Mike. said – no, Tony Robbins said he took his bench press from 135 to 500 pounds on an episode of Larry King. Now, the part that he left out is 135 is full range of motion. 500 pounds is a lockout using power factor training <laughs> program. So it's a, it's a five-second right. lockout, basically a centimeter from lockout. 
So he left that part out. Now, all of this is purposeful. You know, Tony Robbins is not a dumb guy. Tim Ferriss is not a dumb guy. This is all done on purpose. Okay. Another bad example is the Colorado experiment, right? Anytime someone pushes oh, this, you know they're full of shit. The Colorado experience is something that's not Pat Casey, but I, it was one of Mike Menzer's friends, Casey Viator, okay? This genetic, ridiculously genetically gifted bodybuilder. Serious strength and mental toughness. I mean, this guy could squat 500 pounds for 20 reps and then go do 20 reps on the leg press with 600 pounds without a break, right? Just ridiculously genetically gifted. He was involved in a car accident where he lost over 100 pounds of muscle. He couldn't train for a long period of time. Now, this in this book or this program, they talk about how he gained back. I forget what it was. I mean, it was 50 pounds or it was it was a really impressive gain back in 10 days or something along those lines. And then as a result of his results with it, which are going to be completely precise to him for all the reasons I just mentioned, a lot of people tried to sell this program. It used to be an Iron Man magazine all the time in the back, the Colorado experiment, gain 100 pounds in 10 days, something ridiculous like that. And they would use his example, and then they would leave out all of those details, though, at least in the promotion copy. This very program was in Tim Ferriss's four-hour body book. And he talked about how he used right. it to do something or other. Anyone who's ever seen him knows that he's not a big guy, so that's right there. And number two, anyone who tries to push that program, you know, is full of it. And I'm actually, I'm actually in that book talking about how to do a vegan diet effectively. So you, you could say I have a bias not to say any of this stuff, but I'm just being as right. forthright as possible. <clears throat> I'm just giving you examples of bullshittery that is very common in our industry. <laughs> that's why one of my favorite <laughs> books of all time is Dinosaur Training by Brooks Kubik. Because he was so fed up with all the nonsense that he saw at his time in muscle and fitness and all these magazines. So he wrote a very straightforward book focusing on compound exercises and squats and deadlifts and thick bar work, grip strength, taking it back to what a lot of the old-time strongmen did and what he did to get really strong naturally without using any supplements or fancy diets or anything like that. Working out in his garage where there's spider cobwebs in the background, about as rustic as you can imagine. That's still one of my favorite books on strength training. I really felt like you could you could mark the time in history of here's what the fitness world was like before the book and here's what it was like after. And to Iron Man Magazine's credit, they pushed that book a great deal. I think he used to even have a column in there for a while. So if anyone who hasn't read that, you should go get it immediately. It's a great book. Yeah, it's a classic to have on the shelf, man. Big time. So, yep. You'll enjoy it bigly. <laughs> but you still on surveillance in your car, man? <laughs> I'm still on surveillance out here, man. <laughs> the twilight is setting in now. <laughs> what are your, what are what are your goals coming in? We're we're moving into 2017 pretty soon. So are are your goals just a, a continuation of many of the things you've worked on this year, or do you have some new stuff you're working on? Uh, you know, it's 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 a, it's a continuation, to be honest with you. It's a continuation of the same uh, of the same yeah. stuff. I wanna I want to uh, get better with this trap bar. I want to get back to being consistent with the deadlift, of course. So I don't want to ever have to, you know, eliminate any movement patterns from uh, from my from my routine, or or not be able to because of some kind of physical restriction or a scare of an injury or looming or anything like that. I want to be nice and healthy always, and uh, you know, be able to move some good numbers and do them however. And, and to be honest with you, I've been focused away from improving maximal strength for a long time now, for a little, a little, for the most part of this year. Um, and that's, yeah. that's uh, all inclusive, all lifts included. And, um, you know, I hit a PR for my squat this year. I hit 435, I believe. And I hit a PR for the deadlift this year. You know, I hit four, five, 550 for the deadlift. And uh, my strict press, I was still doing uh, two, I've hit 225 for a single and I've hit 215 for three, you know, and uh, those numbers, those are great numbers, you know. And again, when I ask that why question, I sort of don't really have the greatest answer to give myself. And so for that reason, I just want to like, it's like what you said. I can't be training multiple skill sets at the same time as well in the sense of you said lifting, uh, pulling five is very different than pulling three and very different than pulling one, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah, you know, that, and uh, if I had to take the most time to choose what is A, the most transferable to me and B, what I think is going to be the most, um, you know, let the least risk for injury in my particular situation, I think that learning to pull, you know, whether it's five or ten, that would probably be a smarter move for me in this place uh, based on what my goals are and where uh, where yeah. I'm at. 
versus uh, doing heavy singles or doing heavy triples all the time or whatever, you know, and um, yeah. a lot of feats in life, if we do want to take it there in terms of like feats in life and, and whether or not, you know, you have to put your luggage over your head or whatever it was that we were saying, <laughs> um, you know, a lot of feats in life, they do demand our strength, but people seem to neglect the fact that most real feats in life also ask fair amount of your muscular endurance too. You know, and yeah. um, it's not just about absolute max or your one RM because that has probably the least transferability into it, like things that you do have to do. For example, yeah. you know, your your car is broken down. You got to push it. Well, guess what? It's not one effort. You know, you're helping somebody move. Right. You have to carry stuff. You're not doing that one time. Right. You're walking with the thing. You're doing a loaded carry for all sorts of time. Right. So if right. you do want to bring it to everyday life, then we realize that you know what, there is some serious benefit in lifting 10 and lifting five and lifting 15 even, who knows, you know? So, so it's, uh, and then it's mobility, sort of- mobility is the other thing that people neglect. I mean, I've seen people on planes who can't even sit in the chair. They can't even get out of the chair once they sit because their mobility is so poor. It's like you want to do something functional, work on your mobility. You know, so you can yeah. actually forget about putting your bags away in a plane. You can't even sit down on a plane. A problem that a growing amount of people have, especially with, uh, you know, just all the computer and social media stuff right. and f- f- smartphones <laughs> and people's postures, garbage and whatever else. So, uh, yeah, no, that's, uh, that's another thing. And, you know, I did uh, definitely have a window into the mobility thing this uh, this uh, l- last half of the year anyway. So I want to keep that ball rolling as well. Yeah, no doubt. I think mobility is the other thing that's going back to your question much earlier, things you've changed. I never did any joint mobility work when I was younger because I wasn't even aware of it. No one was putting out any of that kind of information. So, I mean, I would do minimal warm up workout, minimal stretching because that wasn't emphasized either. The two things I do now is mobility is every day, long walks every day to decompress and then stretching, a fair amount of stretching at the end of each workout. Also stretching before some exercises, which was always something people recommended again. It's taboo. Well, yeah. Now, now I do hip stretches, hip flexor stretches, and hip stretches before deadlifting. Something I picked up from an article I read on Poliquin's website that Ed Cohen covered at a, a recent seminar they did together. Because if your hips are really tight, that's going to impede the bar speed, especially off the ground. And I found that's made a big difference. So I do a lot of these hip stretches before squats and deadlifts, as well as calf stretches before deadlifts, so that the range of mo- I mean before squats, so that the range of motion is better. So l- little things like that have made a difference. Yeah. That's good. You know, um, it's just funny how much of a revolving door the fitness industry seems to be, and I'm only getting a taste of it now that I'm reaching that sort of that 10-year point in the career. And so, uh, yeah. like, you see stuff that surfaced a long time ago or things that you did in gym class, for example, when you were a teenager right, right. or whatever. You, right. know, you stretch, you, you jog for a lap first, and then you stretch it out <laughs> static stretching style. You know, and then yeah. after that, then you start doing, and then there was this big push about dynamic warm ups and then foam rolling and mobility <laughs> and this and that. And now people are stretching and static again, you know, and now people are doing the same thing they did 25 years ago, you know. So it's right. like, A, people are different. No, no two people are the same. But B, you know, there's certain things that are sort of tried, tested, and true. And again, like, I'm not trying to knock research or anything like that, but research is still stuff that just suggests a certain idea. And there's still a specific pool of people that the research is based around. And you That's cannot right. do, uh, uh, you can't tabulate a, a million people in one shot. It's impossible. So you always you can't have to take you as an individual into account. Right, right. It'll never be that way. Check out, uh, have... check out, check out a book called Muscle Smoke and Mirrors, Lee. I think you'd oh, find yeah. it really interesting. Mark. Andy Roach. There's, there's two volumes, right? And Muscle Smoke okay. and Mirrors basically is a very detailed history of the fitness industry from inception to where it is right now. And it shows how all of these trends have come and gone and then been recycled, repackaged, right. repurposed. It's really interesting because what you said that you've seen in the last 10 years, that is basically mm-hmm. emblematic of what's been going on since inception. Yeah, yeah. I'll take that. I'll take a look at that book for sure. Yeah, yeah you'll enjoy it. Well, cool, man. Anything you have coming mm-hmm. up? Anything you want to plug? Ah, no, nah, you know me, man. I just I keep it real. I don't I don't really know if I have anything that I want to plug, but I've always got a lot of stuff on the go. I've been doing a little bit of uh, speaking lately, which is pretty cool. Um, talking to different uh, colleges and stuff like that, which is pretty awesome. And uh, been getting a little bit of media attention in there as well. So I've been doing some stuff with nice. uh, just local networks around my area and whatnot, and uh, you know, like just nationwide stuff in Canada up here. So 
it's pretty good. And I just hope to keep the ball rolling and, of course, keep the writing going as well and training my clients. So I'm just doing what I'm doing, keeping my head down, grinding, and training myself. Are you are you taking on any new clients? Uh, you know what? Um, online and in person, yeah. I, I don't I don't have uh, anything opposed to actually working with a couple more. Uh, always right. going to be space, and uh, you know, I, I I have my schedule sort of set right now, so it's uh, it's pretty good. But I it can always use a couple more, especially with the kind of clientele that I have, which are the white collar executives for the most part, and so there's a lot of travel and whatnot. So. It definitely makes the schedule more erratic than it would be if I had your solid group of, you know, 20, 20 year old people or sports athletes or something who are in every day per week at a certain time, et cetera, right? So, oh. you know. Okay. Well, great, man. Keep That's up the great deal, work. Every, I, I encourage everyone to follow you on Twitter. You're always putting out some of the best information via that exactly. medium that I've seen. You're very good at getting to the points. So I think both of us retweet you all the time. So follow you on What's, what's your yeah. Twitter handle? Lee? Uh, Coach Lee Boyce at Coach Lee Boyce. Great. And what's your website? Mm-hmm. It's LeeBoyceTraining.com. And finally, where are you based out of? I know you're in Canada, but what part? Yeah, I'm in Toronto. I'm in Toronto, so it's okay. like six degrees mm-hmm. Celsius right now, and people's teeth are chattering. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's good. Good weather. Good weather for sprinting. It'll keep you warm. <laughs> That'll keep you motivated not to slow down. It's like yeah, yeah. Yeah. Get back in the high uh, much shorter, drink. much shorter, much shorter breaks in between each run. That's for sure. Exactly. Yeah. And definitely working on the on those lungs, man. So yeah, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> well, great, man. Great having you back on. Let's let's get you back again next year at some point. We'll see how you're progressing with your goals. For sure. Sounds All good, right, buddy. Man. You have a good one. Thanks a lot, brother. Take care. All right, thanks. All right, everyone, Lee Boyce, strong wealth of knowledge. Always enjoy talking to him. So make sure to follow him on Twitter, check out his website, and also make sure you check out what we're always doing. Not only are we supporting great causes like Project Child Save, make sure you go over to our websites, go to aggressivestrength.com or mikemahler.com and use that coupon code LLA. Go get 10% off my great line of nutrition supplements, ebooks, lectures, DVDs, just about everything you see on there. And how about with you, man? Same thing, newwarriortraining.com, 10% off. Use that coupon code LLA and get it on the digital copies of my DVD, the, also the Wellness Code book. Um, also, you can hit me up if you need a hard copy of the Wellness Code book. I still have some of those lying around. I have some people actually requesting those. So, yes, those are available. So you can use that coupon code for that. And pretty much anything over there you see that you can buy, you can use that coupon code. And other than that, you know, we, we mentioned a couple of times that we discussed – certain things on the premium episode that kind of pertain in this to this um, episode right now. If you want to catch that and become a premium subscriber, head over to patreon.com slash LLA podcast, become a monthly premium subscriber starting at the $5 level. And you can take it up from there. Each little level gets a different benefit and you can have access to those premium episodes, which is just for Patreon subscribers only. And that comes from Mike and myself. And, um, <clears throat> Kind of talked about some other things adding on to that in the upcoming year. So we're not necessarily going to yeah. just go into detail with that. We're throwing it around, but it will make it worth even more worth your while to be a premium subscriber. Well, we're, we're definitely going to start having some guests on the premium episodes, guests talking yeah. about very clearly defined topics. So we're going to, we're definitely going to start rolling that out very soon. And again, it's only going to be yeah. for those of you that are premium members. I mean, we have thousands right. of people listening to the free show. We want to see more of those people on their premium side because otherwise you're the one missing out. You know, we're going to be doing yeah, whether exactly. you subscribe. You know, but, <laughs> exactly. But you're and no, we're not. And we're not going to sit there and go. You know, we're not going to sit there and bring it over here to the free episodes either. It's just like, nah, because that's not fair to the premium subscriber. So, hey, the right. best thing to do is become a premium subscriber. Then you don't have to worry about that. You don't have to worry about the fear of missing out. So there you go, <laughs> folks. And um, other than that, share this episode with everyone you know on social media and leave a review and rate this bad boy on iTunes, Stitcher, tuned in, tune in, all those good things, man. All right, folks. Sounds good. Take care, everyone.